gotta switch this on. The volume. I'm up my mic stand on. Is there a reason why this mic's on? Try yours, Jason. <laughs> Hi, good evening everyone, and thank you once again for joining us this evening. As promised last night, I have three very outstanding young individuals who will be here to uh, cover a number of areas, and I know from the number of questions that we've had from all of you out there, dealing with the social, emotional health and well-being of our our students and staff. Why uh, he brings a lot to the table tonight. I think he'll address a lot of your questions and your concerns. And then, of course, we have John Rudiger, who will spend a lot of time talking about our program and, and how that's going to be rolled out. And then I'm going to wrap it up with a description of the daily routine and schedule for our students. So, with that, I'm going to ask Mr. O'Brien, Dr. O'Brien, to please step forward and um, talk about the social emotional well-being of our students and staff. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, the purpose of this portion of the presentation is to inform you on what we have in terms of our social and emotional supports for our students once we return to school. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Matt O'Brien. I am the uh, Director of Athletics, Health, and Physical Education here in the district, and also one of the high school assistant principals um, here at GHS. Uh, more importantly than that, I am the proud parent of um, two young daughters. Let me take this off if nobody can hear me. Much better. Um, I'm the proud parent of two young daughters, Lola and Zoe. Lola is four, Zoe is two, and the reason I share that with you is because uh, I'm faced with my own anxieties and difficult decisions about sending them back to daycare and to school. Um, and so I just want you to know from one parent to another, we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that our students have what they need when they return. Um, <clears throat> I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the committee work that we did uh, about a month ago, I was um, the co-chair along with Lynn Abrams of the Social and Emotional Learning Committee. And um, I'm really proud and grateful for the work that we did there. It was a committee that had about 19 individuals on it, parents, teachers, um, service providers, uh, administrators. Uh, and our mission was pretty simple. It was to collaboratively put forth a series of recommendations on how to best meet the social and emotional needs of our students. We engage in some meaning, meaningful dialogue uh, about how we can best support the social and emotional needs of our students. And again, I just want to give a shout out to all the people who served on that committee uh, and thank you again for the work that we did. So let's be clear about what social emotional learning is. It is the process through which children and adults uh, do a few things, and that is understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals. Uh, their ability to feel and show empathy for others, it's um, their ability to establish and maintain positive relationships, and also make responsible decisions. And it's not just that, it's also important because it serves as the foundation for academic success in adolescence, but also future success um, as they continue to grow into adulthood. And what we know through the research is that um, individuals who lack some of these social and emotional skills uh, oftentimes are tied to negative outcomes in, as they enter adulthood. Um, in order for us to sort of plot the best course moving forward, I often say this, but we need to sort of take a look at where we are right now and what we know. And here, uh, August 20th, what we know is a few things. We know that uh, children have spent months in isolation. We know that in March there was an abrupt end to their school year. 
and to the things that they really enjoy and love, like sports and other extracurricular activities. And we know that our children have had varying levels of trauma uh, from March until now. Uh, there perhaps was uh, students at home who had to deal with the loss of a loved one. Or I know of students who mom or dad lost their job and all of a sudden had to become the primary income earner in the household. Um, or perhaps had to care for a loved one that was sick. And so we know that when students return to us in just a couple short weeks, uh, there's going to be varying degrees of trauma. And we need to be conscious of that and sensitive to that. Um, we also know that remote instruction will happen first. Uh, and that'll be followed by hybrid instruction just a couple weeks into September. But we also know that some students will not return and that they will elect to stay home entirely and receive their instruction uh, remotely. That's an important point to consider because the supports that we put in place have to be applicable to both populations. They have to be applicable to students who are home learning virtually, but also those students who come back to us and in person and are learning in a hybrid model. We also know that social emotional well-being is the top priority for us here in the district because quite simply learning cannot occur without social emotional well-being. And a common phrase that we hear now is Maslow before Bloom. And essentially what that means is that our children need a sense of belonging and connectedness before we can reasonably expect them to understand and start to apply academic concepts. The goal is simple. The district's goal in formulating the social and emotional supports and the plan as we reopen school is to provide effective, appropriate, ongoing social and emotional support to all students, whether they learn virtually or in person, uh, so that they may recover from this traumatic experience and continue to develop strong, healthy, social and emotional skills. But let's be honest about this. It's not just the students who need social and emotional support. It's also our parents and our teachers. And so this plan, this series of strategies that I'll get into in a moment here, uh, also encompasses the needs of our parents and our teachers. For example, parents. What we, the district will have is an open collaborative dialogue with, um, that allows you to converse with school personnel. There will also be helpful social emotional learning resources and opportunities to engage uh, with school personnel about social emotional learning and strategies. And this will make more sense as we get into it here in a moment. Um, but this, will, this is an important point because this will reinforce social emotional learning concepts at home that are being covered in school. And we also have to realize that our teachers are people too. And they have um, children at home, their mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, and so we need to be able to take care of our teachers as well and support them in terms of their own social and emotional health and well-being. And at the top of that list is meaningful social emotional learning uh, professional development for our teachers that also encompasses tips and tricks on how they can take care of their own social and emotional needs. We need to allow our teachers time to heal, time to adjust to the new work environment, and also some time to reconnect with one another. The truth of it is that our our teachers cannot optimally support students without being emotionally well themselves. And so that is a huge priority for us as we move forward. Let's talk briefly about this concept of multi-tiered system of supports. This is an evidence-based approach to instituting supports and interventions. And you see here the shape of a triangle because the triangle is sort of a perfect way to illustrate that. What I'm going to lay out for you here in a moment is a series of social and emotional supports most of which are at the tier one level, some are at the tier two level, and some are at the tier three level. These tier one supports are known as universal supports. And if you'll notice at the bottom of the triangle here, it's the widest part of the triangle, and that is because all students receive those supports and those strategies. As we move toward the top of the triangle, the triangle gets a little smaller and a little skinnier, and that is because at the tier two level, not all students receive it, but about 20% of those students who need a little bit more support, a little bit more intensive supports than what, what is happening at the tier one level. And then at the tier three level, at the top of the triangle, that's about three to five or three to six percent of our students who will receive those highly intensive, highly individualized social and emotional support. So let's get into it. Tier one supports, also known as universal supports. When we talk about tier one universal supports, 
Uh, that is at the bottom of the triangle. Again, the wide base, every student is getting these supports. This is uh, supports designed for all students, and these are proactive strategies. These are proactive supports, not reactive. A lot of this plan in these series of um, uh, supports that I'm going to lay out here was done by the committee and put forth by the committee. And so at the top of that list is professional development for all teachers. And when I say all teachers, I mean all teachers, K through 12. This is hugely important. Trauma-informed SEL strategies for the classroom. I am hugely grateful to a woman by the name of Elizabeth McLeod. She is the director and co-founder of the Institute for Social and Emotional Learning. Her and I have been on the phone back and forth for weeks. And as you can imagine, every school district basically in the country is in a mad scramble right now to get um, social emotional training for their teachers. I am immensely grateful to Elizabeth McLeod for accommodating us and she is going to prepare a series of trainings for all of our teachers K through 12 in social emotional learning, how to integrate those strategies and those techniques into the classroom for classroom teachers, but also some tips and tricks for self-care, how teachers can take care of their own social and emotional well-being. So at the top of that list is professional development for all of our teachers K through 12 and how to integrate social emotional learning and those strategies into their everyday classroom teaching, both virtually and in person. I also want to mention for a moment um, our health and phys ed classes as we move forward and as students return to us virtually in September and then in a hybrid model later in September. Um, in terms of health and phys ed, every single class, K through 12, will now be what I'm calling SEL enhanced. Um, and what that will be is a daily mindfulness exercise, daily guided breathing exercises, and we'll also see a lot more and utilize more reflections and journal writing. Mindfulness and guided breathing is a great way to self-regulate, to teach children emotional regulation and recognition. Uh, and reflections and journal writing are also a significant and proven way to do that as well. In terms of the PE curriculum itself, for obvious reasons, we need to be conscious of safety elements when we return to school. Um, the modified PE curriculum will encompass more fitness-based and activity-based exercises and activities that are conducive to social distancing, to um, not sharing equipment with one another because we certainly can't do that, um, and also activities that don't require a lot of equipment in the first place. So that's obvious for safety purposes and transmission reasons, but um, we know that physical activity and regular exercise are also powerful reducers of stress and anxiety, particularly in young children. And so for those reasons, our PE curriculum will be slightly modified as we open in September. We also have a district-wide commitment here to prioritizing relationship building and a sense of connectedness in each classroom. We are committed to that at the start of the school year for the first several weeks of school, virtual and hybrid. We don't want to say it's certainly not at the expense of academic work, but it is an emphasis on making sure that our students, when they return to us, feel comfortable, that they feel safe, and that they feel connected to their new school environment, that they're connected to their new routines, uh, and to their teachers. We know this to be important because we know that a sense of connectedness and relationships while students are here at school is conducive to learning and to academic success. And again, this idea of Maslow before Bloom. One huge um, topic of conversation in our committee meetings was this um, idea of advisory periods, particularly at the middle school and the high school level. Other schools in the area and elsewhere use advisory periods for a varied um, you know, number of, of purposes. For our purposes here, uh, advisory periods will be utilized at the high school um, and also at the elementary school and the middle school, although at the elementary school and the middle school they'll have a slightly different feel to them. At the high school we'll have scheduled time every day in which students meet in an advisory period with a faculty advisor. The reason for this is that we want our students to be able to build more personal, stronger connections with peers and faculty during these advisory periods. And the goal, and it's really about the culture, not so much about the content in advisory, but the goal is to create and build a safe space where students can connect with their feelings and share outward their feelings. 
and also participate in meaningful discussions facilitated by the teacher. One thing that appeals to me very much about these advisory periods, particularly at the high school, is that there are a lot of things going on in society right now. COVID is one of those things, but there's also a lot of racial issues and injustice issues and a lot of things that impact our teenagers' lives and things that they're thinking about. And so an advisory period is a great way for them to reflect on that, share their feelings about that, and participate in meaningful discussions about these issues. Another topic of conversation and a, and a point of emphasis in the committee was this idea that we need to present more visual information in the form of videos regarding the new, no, the new normal in returning to school. The reason being is that, understandably so, myself included, there is a lot of anxiety about returning to school. Um, and so providing visual information and videos to parents and students about what classrooms are going to look like now. When is it okay to wear a mask and when is it not? New traffic patterns in the hallways. What is that going to look like in each building? Some stairwells might be a one way up and a one way down. Uh, the hallways will be one way. How are you supposed to move through the building? And also some, some clarity on some new guidelines and protocols and procedures upon returning to school. Presenting that kind of information in a visual video format would go a long way in terms of lessening the anxiety about returning to school and not really understanding what it's going to look like. Um, these videos are uh, in the works as we speak right now. I have to thank the amazing work of uh, Jim Quinlan for doing these videos and, um, and putting that together and helping us do that as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the goal is to engage parents in a more meaningful way and provide them with more resources and opportunities to engage with school personnel like myself about social emotional learning strategies and supports. A tremendous idea that came from the committee work was this idea of creating an SEL book club. Um, truth be told, in full transparency, we have a book club professional development that was started um, a few weeks ago at the high school about culturally responsive teaching. And so the idea is to create, recreate that type of professional development, that type of workshop, but also to include parents on that. And the reason for that is, is, a, is a couple different reasons. Number one is it takes a village, right? And so if we want SEL concepts that are being taught at school to be reinforced at home and vice versa, engaging parents and teachers and school personnel together in these type of meaningful opportunities is a great way to do that. But we also want to keep parents and teachers engaged about SEL and keep the conversation going about social and emotional learning. And we also want to provide resources to you at home on, on things that you can do when you're home to better develop your, your own children's social and emotional skills. I have spent uh, a lot more time with my kids since March at home and I found myself asking myself um, what am I doing? What am I doing right as a parent? What am I doing wrong? Uh, what can I be doing better? And so, you know, as a parent, my goal is to also facilitate my own children's uh, development of their social and emotional skills. And so by providing resources on an ongoing basis to all of you at home, I think it might be useful for all of you as well. We are going to pilot a specific SEL program at the elementary school. Um, this particular program is known as the RULER program. It stands for Recognizing, Understanding, Labeling, Expressing, and Regulating. And essentially, it is designed to build the social and emotional t intelligence in young children. To understand why they feel the way they feel, label those emotions, and then express them outwardly in an appropriate and effective way. This will be piloted at the elementary school um, with the exploration of perhaps expanding this as we move forward, so that we expand this program to other classrooms and maybe to a, uh, at a building level. We have a hugely important issue, and the committee recognized this as well, and that is if we truly want to screen and assess students when they come back to school, there needs to be some sort of survey or some sort of screening measure that we utilize. Um, the students, when they return to us, will be given a well-being survey. This is not a psychological assessment. This is nothing um, uh, to be concerned with. But what this is is a survey. It's a questionnaire that is designed to assess 
the positive and negative feelings that our children are experiencing when they return to us, but also how well they feel supported. How much support do they feel when they return? And I've included some sample questions here. In the past week, how often did you feel happy or sad? Also, is there a teacher or adult at school you can count on if you need help with something? What we need to understand is that responses to this questionnaire and this survey, or any survey for that matter, uh, the responses are kept completely confidential. Um, they'll only be seen by building administrators like myself or school service providers like a school psychologist or social worker. And this will be done simply to assess a student's level of need as they return so that we can better help them and service them. I'm very excited about this Tier 1 support, and that is Youth Mental Health First Aid Training. Now, as of right now, it stands that we will, uh, the high school teachers will receive Youth Mental Health First Aid Training um, in the first week of September. And this is a program that's designed to train teachers to identify students in need and how to respond effectively and appropriately. <coughs> as of right now, this program is only available to us for children ages 12 to 18. And so as I mentioned, in the first week of September, our high school teachers and faculty will receive this training, and then we will then move toward the middle school for teachers of seventh and eighth graders as well. Lynn Abrams will provide this training for us. She is a certified mental health first aid instructor, and she is also the district's health and wellness coordinator, and I can't praise her enough for all the work that she's done in terms of mental health and mental health first aid training. Last but certainly not least, and maybe the simplest but most profound strategy that we have in place is this idea of collaborative dialogue between school personnel and parents. Parents are invited to speak with school principals and building administrators if they are concerned about their child's emotional state as their child re-enters school. Detail and context matters. And what I mean, what, what I mean by that is I am on the phone with parents almost every day and we are talking about the experiences of their children, what things were like for their family during the shutdown, during COVID at its height. And so for some individuals, some students, as they return to school, I can better service them and be there for them because I know kind of the context and the detail about what things were like for them and their family um, during the quarantine. And so that collaborative dialogue is hugely important. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's move into Tier 2. Tier 2 is more intensive supports. And a lot of times, most of the time, these Tier 2 supports fall on the shoulders of our school support staff, our school psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors, and so forth. Um, but these supports are meant for students who require some additional support above those supports that are in Tier 1 that we just went through. Um, I have to thank the support staff, particularly at the high school, uh, Mary Keller, our school psychologist, Katie Schaefer, our social worker, our guidance staff, uh, and Joe P. Uh, they do a tremendous job and I work with them very closely. And so um, I am amazed at how they go above and beyond for our students. But that level of support is indicative of a Tier 2. Tier 2 supports. Um, these are more intensive, sometimes smaller group if necessary or if appropriate. We utilize counselors, psychologists, social workers for greater support during return to school. We utilize, we will utilize regular check-ins both in person and virtually with a school counselor or a school psychologist. Parent consultations for a more holistic approach, whether it's a phone call or if parents want to come in and speak with us. And we also typically at the tier two level will offer small group counseling sessions when appropriate. As we move up the triangle, we know that tier three is at the top of the triangle. <coughs> and we know that these uh, supports are highly intensive, individualized supports. What each building will have in place is a student support team. And this student support team is made up of a social worker, school psychologist, guidance counselor, administrator, and their job is to work in conjunction and collaboration with parents and guardians and families for a more holistic approach to working with that child and making sure that they receive the supports that they need. Um, the job at Tier 3 is largely to support and connect families with available resources that are out in the community, 
Although there are situations where individual counseling sessions are appropriate and done, as well as individualized behavior and safety plans. In closing, when we think about the Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 supports for social, emotional learning and development, <coughs> although it's been a challenging time, I want you to know that we as a district are committed to meeting the social and emotional needs of all of our students and to continuing to facilitate those social, the social and emotional intelligence of all of them as we move forward. Uh, my email here is on the screen and I want to welcome any questions or concerns you may have. It would be my pleasure to respond to you and to continue that dialogue. Um, if I can switch gears for just a moment, I want to give you a brief uh, snapshot of where we are in terms of athletics. I know that there has been some questions and some curiosity about what is happening with athletics. As of right now, we are scheduled to start fall sports on September 21st. As of right now, team workouts and practices are still prohibited. Governor Cuomo is expected, though, to make an announcement regarding New York State Athletics next week, and I anticipate that and anxiously await what he has to say about uh, the state of athletics here in New York State. Section 9, our local, and governing, our local governing body, will plan accordingly after Governor, Governor Cuomo makes his announcements. If athletics is not allowed to begin on September 21, there is a very strong possibility that we move to a three-sport model that goes from, that begins in January and ends in June. Essentially with the winter season happening from January to February, the fall season then happening from February to March or April, and the spring season closing out the academic year starting in April and ending in end of May or early June. It is not definitive and is not set in stone, but there is a strong possibility that that takes place, but we won't know for sure until Governor Cuomo makes his announcement next week and we receive more definitive guidance from New York State and also Section 9. And certainly once we have more definitive information, um, a detailed communication will be sent home, making sure that all of us are on the same page about what is happening in terms of athletics. I want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and I wish you well. Go Gladiators. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, folks, uh, for those of you that tuned in tonight, uh, you can tell your friends that we will look to have all of what Dr. O'Brien presented tonight. We'll put that on our website so that it can be, can be seen by everyone out there. Uh, I would next like to turn our program over to uh, John Reiker. And uh, those of you that were with us last night, you, you heard what I said about John, but I'll just say it again. Um, when this all came down on us back on March 13th, uh, John Redeker stepped up big time. Uh, he really helped navigate this district through some very, very difficult times and waters. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, John, and we thank, thank you for all your efforts. More importantly, we thank you for the hard work that you've done with our staff and preparing us for the uh, reopening of school. With that, John, you're on. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, let me just double check and make sure our, my webcam is working effectively here. All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending this, uh, this meeting tonight, um, and we hope to address a number of your questions and concerns regarding uh, technology and what it looks like for your children and what it looks like for um, in-person versus remote instruction and uh, device access and things like that. So I'm looking forward to uh, walking through just a few slides tonight and then being able to answer uh, perhaps some questions later on through uh, Assistant Superintendent Mr. Carter. We'll have some more feedback about what the actual day-to-day -day operations look like for people in our schools. So uh, I, I am uh, sort of alone here with the distance, so I'm, I'm going to remove this just for the sake of um, clarity here tonight. So um, moving forward here, um, the first point that I want to discuss with you is access. And the most important thing that we want uh, for every single Goshen student 
is that they will have access to a device that they need, and we are going to provide that for them. Okay, so we hope that um, every student will have not only what they own perhaps from their home for what you're used to using already to connect and, and to connect with friends and, and all, um, games and all those things that you might have in your home already, um, but we will be rolling out an official um, what we call like a one-to-one -one Chromebook program where every student in our district will be entitled to get their own Chromebook. Um, and that is going to be a little bit, you'll, you'll be hearing more about that. Um, there are more uh, details coming. Uh, for logistics, and I don't want to get into the weeds of that this evening. But uh, many of you have Chromebooks. We uh, were able to outfit um, over 500, close to 600 or more people um, in the spring closing time that we had between uh, March and June, um, including some replacements and things like that, sudden needs that arose. Uh, so we're able to, to disseminate those from different buildings. But um, it's going to be very important for us to enable everyone to have the full access that they need. Um, to start a collection process uh, next week. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that very soon, but we'll start a collection process of the things that have been disseminated so that we can collect and wipe down and, and look them over for any uh, potential damage that they may have to address. And then we will move over and uh, start a new distribution process in the evenings uh, for that staff development week that we have coming up in the beginning of September. So when your students are not yet in school, but we are getting ready for them, we will be uh, disseminating uh, Chromebooks in the evenings, um, and you'll, hear, you'll be hearing more about that. Um, so that being said, um, you may not get back the same Chromebook that you had originally. Um, certainly there's a high likelihood of that. Um, there may be some different models and things like that, but we want to do that uh, really smart in thinking about uh, who has access to what devices, so that um, even the teachers understand what their student population has, that when they're designing a lesson or, or an activity, uh, for hybrid or, re or remote learners that they can address a true need for uh, the correct application that they can use. So we are going to be, uh, stay tuned for that, we'll be disseminating some information further. Um, if you have your own device, some of you have mentioned this in our sur opening surveys that some of you said, hey, I, my, my child has their own device and they would be happy to bring that in, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever platform it is, if it's a Chromebook, a PC, a MacBook, or something like that, it doesn't, uh, whatever the device is, um, because we use the Google Suite um, that would be allowable, um, it is more likely allowable through your building principal at the high school, which is why my notes here say it may be an option. Uh, principal Martin is uh, inclined to start allowing that. Uh, we will have more details released on that as well. Um, and we'll be considering that uh, perhaps for other buildings, but tonight at this moment, I'm not ready to further uh, explain that uh, until we talk more with the individual building principals about that comfort level. Um, when we approach a um, hybrid model, when we start bringing students into school, is when it's going to be most important to have the access of their, their device in hand, which is why we're disseminating them instead of having to work through cleaning and charging and carts overnight. Um, students are going to be expected to bring these Chromebooks to school fully charged and ready to go throughout the day. Um, so that will be a baseline expectation, just like bringing a pencil and a pen. It'll be a fully charged Chromebook is the expectation that they will have uh, in coming to school uh, once we start the in-person approach to the instructional model. Um, if, you're high, if you're going to choose the remote option, we still like to get you a Chromebook. Uh, if you choose not to uh, because you have your own devices, um, certainly that would be an option as well. Uh, we also have a limited number of Wi-Fi hotspots. We're very concerned with access. In fact, these were actually un unreachable. We could not purchase Wi-Fi hotspots uh, through the spring uh, semester when we were closed since March um, because the demand was so high. We could not even obtain them, and we did try. We looked around. We know that there are pockets and areas of need in our neighborhoods and our communities, um, but this is going to be tr a true needs basis that we want to disseminate the Wi-Fi hotspots. We're going to ask you to contact the building principal if you believe that there's a need for you because you don't have reliable internet access at home. Um, and so we will uh, be engaging that, but again, that's a limited number. Um, and so we hope to do that based on true need alone. So please be uh, respectful, but also understand that that's an option for you. Um, the school, I wanted to mention some other uh, opportunities for access. If you need to access the internet, um, the school broadcasts Wi-Fi in a pretty wide net. Uh, many of our school buildings have Wi-Fi into the parking lots um, near our athletic facilities. Um, and so in, in managing your social distance and your physical proximity with people and things like that, there may be opportunities if you needed to connect um, to park a car, set up a camp chair, something like that, perhaps sometimes if needed um, in our facilities. We'd like to make sure that that's available for people as well. 
Uh, the Goshen Public Library has also done a tremendous amount of work in extending their wireless network this past uh, spring and summer. Uh, in fact, I know a number of teachers who have met in the field of Salesian Park and picked up the Wi-Fi from the Goshen Public Library, which is open with no password, and they have sat under a tree and collaborated and planned lessons for all of your students coming in for next year. So uh, that's pretty a, a neat story from the summer, uh, but something that is available to all of our families as well if you can get there. Uh, we also want to mention that on our website, um, and I'll be posting these notes again on the website, and we'll put them up uh, for some notes for the Q&A sessions to look back on, but on our district website, you can find a bunch of resources that were published from OU BOCES about uh, some ways to obtain some uh, internet access. So some of them are also needs-based, but uh, certain companies are offering some flexibility for pricing and uh, arrangements for people as they may need uh, some access during this time. So that, that can be very valuable to you. I also want to highlight, though, um, there is a great website called everyoneon.org. Uh, that is a federal website that you can put your zip code in and you can highlight your area of need. So if you are someone who is, uh, receives free or reduced lunch or you receive, you're on uh, welfare, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, you can check these boxes and it will determine, uh, based on your financial need, what, um, what price points are available for you. For you from certain vendors who are trying to help in this time as we look for that. Uh, internet access is a federal concern that we're looking at and there are a number of organizations that are actually working towards um, developing more access for students especially during this time so uh, that is something that um, all districts and students are faced with and we're trying to provide many areas of access for you um, to help support that at this time. Um, I do want to highlight, though, uh, as we give these devices out, I just put a screenshot here of our district website. This is from our technology page. I just want to highlight that um, as we hand out devices and um, actually uh, Chrome accounts, um, I just want to mention that um, all of our policies that you normally sign off on at the beginning of a school year, including our um, safety, our cyberbullying, um, our acceptable use policies, are all still um, going to be enforced via protocols if anything were to happen this school year. I do want to draw your attention to these policies um, that sometimes we, you know, at the beginning of the school year, you might just often sign some papers. I'm a parent too, you kind of breeze through, but it's going to be very important to understand some of these protocols uh, now as we look at having different devices and access in our schools. So I'll highlight that for you. A number of questions that have come up in our surveys have been about the overwhelming uh, <laughs> amount of passwords and usernames that students have to engage with, especially for our, our littlest students, our youngest ones. Um, even for our oldest students, many of them uh, struggle with this. Um, frankly, our teachers struggle with this. What's my password? Where do I log in? And all those kind of things. Um, we, as we look at new software applications, we have invested uh, tremendous amounts of resources into identifying some of the best software uh, components for our schools. And we are going to be logging them in through ClassLink. And this is just a little screenshot of what the ClassLink portal looks like. If you had a student at GIS last year, you have already experienced this. We'll be sending out tutorials and information about how to sign, access this portal and sign into it. But ClassLink will serve for two things for us. Number one, it will be a, a password locker. Uh, so it will save your passwords. In fact, some applications, students won't even need to know their passwords. They will log into this portal and they'll have access to all of their services. So that is a huge time saver and a great uh, ease of service for people. Uh, we're excited to, to see how ClassLink works for us. Uh, we know that many school districts locally and, the, and throughout the state have been using this um, and we're excited to be partnering with them. Their support has been great. We know that you'll appreciate that service. They will also help provide for us a level of privacy safety, which we want to be concerned with as well. Um, and over the past few years and a bunch of edits and concerns, New York State passed a law called Ed Law 2D, or well, New York State Ed Law 2D, and it really is about protecting your child's privacy. Um, including all of their personal identifiable information um, and security things. So this is a reciprocal or, uh, relationship where uh, we don't just buy into an organization's privacy policy, uh, they have to agree to Goshen's legal privacy policy. And so um, only websites that are in here in class link will be, uh, are ones that have been signed off on that, that privacy policy. So we're excited about that opportunity for two reasons. One, we're, we're deeply concerned with keeping your children safe um, and data is uh, a big um, you know, issue right now in terms of hacking and access and things like that. But student data privacy, as well as the ease of convenience for accessing your academic work, um, ClassLink will be a huge uh, portal for you to, uh, to consider that moving forward. When students log into ClassLink, they will have a portal that looks like this. 
Um, this is, they'll have more things, more tiles there, but it's very visually appealing. You can see that this looks like apps or, uh, you know, like almost like an, a, a tablet environment or something like that. But they will have these apps and icons and wherever you see a key icon in the corner of those, it means that there's a password saved and it's just a click through. So once you sign into ClassLink, if I want to go to GoFormative or EdPuzzle, one of these programs that are in here, um, I can click through and it will take me right to that portal so that I can um, easily engage with what I need to do. So I think you'll appreciate that as parents. The other important thing about ClassLink that we need to be aware of is that ClassLink will also track some of our data metrics. So I might be able to go out and go to these websites on my own, but ClassLink will also be able to track student activity. And we're very interested in using ClassLink to help track student attendance, especially for the remote learners who need to be engaged in, uh, in processes without being in person. So if we can track time on task by seeing that kids are actually on the websites and portals that we ask them to, as long as it's signed into ClassLink, it will track that for us. And so that will help keep us uh, keep track of attendance uh, for state reporting and for making sure that your children are, are uh, connecting with us in all sorts of ways. So uh, that would be a very important component of ClassLink as well. Well, you'll hear more about that. I want to take a minute and just put the Google image up here. This is the Chrome icon. I just want to take a minute and I'll put more information on the website about this. But I wanted to just highlight that um, your child's Chrome account, which ends at, at student.gcsny.org. Um, if you're an incoming parent, um, you'll be hearing more about how to log into that um, very shortly. But you, uh, their, their Chrome account is also district property. So just like their uh, Chromebook would be district property, so is their Chrome account. So that means that their internet filtering, uh, their, their um, access and those kind of things will be monitored. And I just want to highlight that because if we are in families that are using shared devices, it's very important to think about signing out and, uh, of, a, of an account completely and signing into another um, for your own personal use or another child or anything like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that might get flagged in a school district, perhaps being inappropriate that we don't want to be children to be flagged on because an adult was using their account by accident or something like that on a shared device. And so uh, if you have concerns or questions about how to manage that independently, most uh, computers, tablets, etc., have an option to toggle out of an account into another one. Um, and so just be aware of that as you're using Chrome uh, in your household. And if you're not a Chrome user, perhaps it might be easier to use another browser while your children are using Chrome as well. So that's just a, a, a word of warning for you and a caution, but also to remind you that we are helping and we are concerned, again, like Dr. O'Brien said about the kids' socio-emotional wellness, we want to think about what they're looking at and are they looking at inappropriate things, just like we would at school, um, that will follow them. And I think that that's an important component. Remember, that is because it is a school account. If they're using another account, we won't see that. There's no sort of like privacy issue there. It is a school account that we want to be concerned about um, and help protect your children. As far as a uh, workflow is concerned, I wanted to mention this. This is something that I've made a video about on our website. Um, I think the article was posted, if I look back, on April 14th. It is still very relevant. There is a video out there that I posted about how to help your children. And so I want to mention this with our technology. It can be overwhelming to think about the workflow and the portal for how we actually engage with these devices because they're not bringing home a notebook and they're not bringing home a, a to-do list and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's hard to see where, where to go with that. So I want to highlight this workflow and I'll just, I just, I'm not going to go to all these places here tonight, but I just wanted to show you this workflow as a way to help your children. Again, we'll have these notes up for you to look back on once the school year fully kicks off. But every child K-12 has a Gmail account. It is protected. It is really an internal Gmail account. Um, they can only communicate with people from Goshen School District. So you can't, you know, unfortunately send your child an email, hey, how are you kind of thing in the morning. Um, unless I guess you're a teacher and employee in the district because that's connected. But Gmail uh, is an aggregate. So if there's an announcement, if there is an update from a principal, if there is um, information from Google Classroom, that information will come to Gmail first. If there's graded work, if there's new work assigned, if there's an announcement about a Google Meet that's coming up special, um, that will be aggregate in their Gmail. So I encourage people to check their Gmail first because it gives a big picture overview of what's going on for a day. Especially for those who are choosing the remote option, it's gonna be very important to also then look at the, um, the Google Calendar next. So Google Calendar links up to Google Classroom and if there's due dates on assignments, uh, you'll want to see that, you'll see that first in a calendar format. 
I'd also encourage students to start using the calendar to put on their events, to put on their other activities, even if they're if it's a Zoom call with scouts or whatever it might be. Use the Google Calendar and start managing that very well. And parents, you can log in as the child on your own devices to see what's on their calendar as well. Uh, just like opening their notebook or binder, but you can log into their accounts as well. There's no parent access on that necessarily, but you would just log in as your child. Um, once you're in the Google Calendar, you'll see due dates and assignments with links right to them if you want to jump into Google Classroom and to see them. So that's where I highlighted Google Classroom next. Google Classroom has an awesome portal on the left-hand side, um, and it's a to-do list. It's awesome. I think a lot of us miss that sometimes. But to think about a to-do list with upcoming due dates and things like that is very helpful, especially if you're in the secondary level where you might be in five or six different Google Classrooms. Uh, but even some of our elementary students are in multiple Google Classrooms because of their special, special area teachers as well. So it's very important to see that, that portal and there's lots of trainings even already on our website, some tutorials and lots of things online about that. Of course, we'll be sending out more as well. And then once you're in Google Classroom, the, the next step would be to then, uh, if there's a portal, if the teacher asks you to go and do something in another activity, um, then you would go into class link to sign into those portals and to go and do that activity. So while there might be a link to an assignment or something like that, it will prompt them to sign in via class link to do that. So this is the workflow that I'd like to see uh, to encourage parents to think about is start with Gmail, go to Google Calendar, then look at the details in Google Classroom. And then if you need to sign in for an assignment, then you can go and, and if they tell you, go to this website and complete these activities, then you click through class link to go do those things. So that'll be a way to uh, help engage in that process. And I think that that'll help streamline work for parents as we're all helping, trying to help at home with our own children as well in this, in this modified learning environment. As far as connection in any of the remote cases, uh, when students are home, uh, whether they're on the hybrid model or on the remote model that we're, that we're offering, um, there'll be a need for an audio visual connection. And so we will be using Google Meet for that. Google Meet is the built-in video integration tool for our G Suite, Enterpri uh, G Suite for Education, which is what we embrace with our Google Suites, what I'm using here tonight, uh, and again, their Google accounts that they have. Um, Google Meets will uh, be scheduled um, for at least the secondary level um, on sort of the bell schedule. We're gonna, you'll hear more about what that looks like uh, from Assistant Superintendent Carter, um, and you'll think, hear about what the day-to-day -day looks like for that. But having access to um, a computer that has a webcam and microphone, that's why you're going to have a, a Chromebook given to you. Um, and if you have your own, that's fine. You may want to think about headphones. It's just preferential if you want to hear uh, you know, without noise, depending on where you live, how, what the environment's like. Um, and you may want to think about some peripherals like that, uh, but those are just preferences to think about. There will be times when uh, people may ask to tune in with your uh, microphone and webcam. And there'll be times when it's okay not to have it on. Right? We don't need to have a window into the student who's at home all of the time. But again, there is a bit of that personal connection that would be helpful. And so uh, we'll sort of put out some protocols as this unfolds a little bit further to talk about that. But very important to understand that uh, there will be times when we're asking students to connect. And then in any of that synchronous learning, when the teacher is teaching in the building and, and students are at home listening, uh, we, will, we will have that portal open into the classroom so that teachers can hear, um, perhaps with headphones, we're, we're, we're figuring some of those logistics out, but teachers can hear if there's questions being asked and then respond to those students on the computer as well as the students in the class via Google Meet. So we're, we're excited about that. We're gonna do um, a lot of great work here with Google Meet as a nice option for us. Um, a lot of us might get stuck at some point. It's just the nature of technology. There are issues that are going to unfold and we don't always know what to do. I wanna highlight a few ways to ask for help. Again, we'll put these notes out there for you on the website. Uh, sometimes I get emails from people and I, I don't really know what they're looking at. I don't really know what the problem is. And so I wanna highlight here today a few ways that you can help us help you. And one of them is by taking a screenshot. So um, there are a couple of things here on a PC, on a Mac, on a Chromebook, there's different ways to take a screenshot. But if you're stuck, or if you're getting an error message, it may be helpful to do that. Frankly, the old fashioned way, but just take your cell phone and take a picture of the screen and send it to us as you might be stuck on a website or, or, or error message or something like that. The other way to do this is to look at a screen recording. I think my webcam is blocking off the bottom there, but um, we uh, one of the softwares that we purchased for um, educational purposes, but can serve in this regard as well, 
is that we purchased Screencastify, so that, uh, which is a screen recording tool. So if you're getting stuck somewhere, you can run Screencastify. We'll put out some training on this too, but you could run Screencastify and actually show us a video or perhaps narrate for us what the problem is and send that to your teacher, your tech support person, uh, et cetera. Okay, so we can think about that. As far as tech support is concerned, um, tech support for physical devices can only take place on Goshen School District owned devices. All right, our tech services folks will not be um, working on your uh, personally owned device, but if you have a problem with your, um, your Chromebook that we hand you, um, then you, there is a form. Uh, I linked it at the bottom, just a little picture there, uh, but it's li listed on our website under the COVID uh, resource page. But if you, want, if you have a problem with your Chromebook, if it's not connecting, if it's, uh, you know, something happened to it, unfortunately, you know, accidents happen, you can send out a, a support request and we'll try to get back to you within, uh, I think it says within 48 hours or something like that, but it's a pretty fast turnaround. Uh, we started using that this spring. It's been uh, very successful. Uh, so we have a great team to support that and we, we encourage you to, to do that if you need it. If you need instructional support, um, the first step would be to talk to your classroom teacher. Right? Maybe they're, you just misunderstand, maybe someone's misunderstanding directions or they're not sure if they can do it a different way or something like that. But talk to your classroom teacher and then talk to your building tech personnel. There are fabulous people in all four of our school buildings. And I listed their names on the slide. Their names are available on our instructional technology website as well. Um, so contact them if you have any questions and I'll always be available as well to any parent or child who has a problem or needs some technology support in how to use the software, um, if they're having a login problem, uh, if they're just having general instructional problems that they, need, they may need some help with. But we are here for you. Um, even though we're not here in person with all of you, we are here for you in that regard. So the, uh, I wanna sort of wrap up with this slide here. And one of the things that I get excited about is, is that um, connecting students to the internet and to each other remotely is a huge way that the world connects, right? We live in a global economy where people are connecting in an instant. I have a colleague who lives in New York City who runs a project-based learning consortium and she is, has a business of three. She runs the business and her finance person is in Eastern Europe sorry, no, East, uh, Southeast Asia, and her, uh, her website designer is in, is in Europe. And so they just collaborate online, they met online, they've never met in person, and that's a lot of the way that business is done. So we have an opportunity here to really think about some new things, uh, to, to sort of leverage this opportunity to put kids with devices, to think creatively and innovatively about what this can hold for them, both today and for their futures. So I'm excited that we might be able to get to this point where we are, we're creating more than consuming on our devices, that we're thinking about the global economy and how to connect in the world and how to empower learners to find answers and to ask questions, um, but really to create some of their own knowledge as they go and they look to, create, to fix, find out problems that they're concerned about and find solutions for them using the tools that we're putting out there for them. So I think we're primed in a great opportunity to, um, to start doing some of those things. Uh, we've done some of that already, and I'm excited to think about where this takes us academically into the future. So I just want to sort of land it there that there's a lot of questions and concerns I know about our, uh, the plans and the state and, and all these guidelines that are out there. But as far as um, our, our educational opportunity here is that the sky's the limit to think about how we can connect and really empower our learners to do some incredible things, uh, both today in class and tomorrow when they grow up and they, they do some incredible things. We've seen it already with our students. We know that there are incredible and, um, opportunities out there, and we're excited to see where um, your students will take this opportunity moving forward. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions or concerns, I'll be happy to engage over email, we'll have a phone call, set up a Google Meet, uh, whatever it might take to help answer some of your questions. Thank you, everybody. And I, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Superintendent Connor and Assistant Superintendent Carter and uh, be, please be in touch if you have any questions or concerns. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Redeker. Once again, an outstanding job, very informative, and as he stated in his notes, and also Dr. O'Brien's, I'm sure will be going up on our website. And uh, before I move over to uh, Mr. Carter, I just want to uh, remind folks that within the next week or so, uh, we have Jim Quinlan, who is a high school English teacher, and Jim is responsible, or was responsible, for the outstanding awards and um, graduation program. If any of you were, uh, had, had a chance to see that, uh, you know it was outstanding, it was extremely well done. 
I would ask uh, Jim if he wouldn't mind if uh, he would meet with our building principals, our middle managers, and we will do videos with each one of them, which I think you will all find extremely helpful. And uh, you're going to see what they look like with a mask on our principals. You'll see what they look like without a mask on. And uh, but they will lead you through what it's like to uh, what it's like to be a student at Scotchtown or GIS or the middle school or the high school. And once again, I want our cafeteria people on there and our buildings and grounds and transportation. And perhaps we can get Nurse Nancy once again to uh, make an appearance. But with that, um, and I would be remiss too before I wrap up with uh, Mr. Carter, I want to thank our middle managers, our building principals. They've done an outstanding job, and all the guys that have appeared here in the last two shows. Um, I want to thank them. Uh, they continue to do an outstanding job, and I really look forward to us being ready for an opening of another school year. So. With that, here to talk about the description of our daily routine and schedules is Mr. Carter. And before I turn it over to him, I want to thank him for his excellent work and uh, all the time and effort that he's put forth as well. Thank you, Mr. Carter, and the floor is yours. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first want to start off also by you know just thanking the people that you've seen this evening and also the people that you have seen Last evening, uh, it was a great collaborative effort to get to this point to present this large amount of information. Uh, and also, I do want to thank all of our building level administrators. We have spent a tremendous amount of time together in the planning phases. Um, and through the collaborative efforts put forth, we are able to present to you what we feel is a, a very good learning model in both the remote and hybrid forms. Uh, of course, with the goal of getting back to in-person learning in the near future. Uh, as Mr. Connor has uh, left my side, I'll, I'll take my mask off to uh, allow you all to hear me a bit better, possibly. Uh, so again, you know, the collaborative efforts that were put forth by all, uh, it's gotten us to this point. Uh, and although it may seem as though we go through these potential schedules uh, very quickly, again, please know that it took great efforts to get uh, to the point where we are comfortable with what we are presenting. Um, right down to the building level management of the traffic flow, the signage that's necessary, and everything in between, um, all the things that were mentioned last evening. Knowing that we are beginning with uh, remote, fully remote live stream instruction on September 8th, running through and including September 18th, um, please know that what I will do this evening is give you the, the overview at all four buildings, um, focusing primarily on our elementary and, and secondary in that split, um, covering the hybrid model first, because that will give you an idea of the transportation, the drop-off, um, movement throughout the building, and the normal um, course of, of daily routines within the buildings during hybrid, but also moving into remote, knowing that we will be following many of the same schedules. So. Um, again, remember we're starting with the overview of a hybrid schedule and everything is subject uh, to change with information that is provided um, mostly on a daily basis. So at Goshen High School, um, when we get into hybrid learning models, we expect the bus arrivals to begin at approximately 7:10 a.m. and those bus arrivals will be staggered, uh, of course coming in every few minutes to allow us to have students exit the bus and to get into the entrance lines that will be established while maintaining proper social distancing, helping us to avoid any backups at the main entrance because as you are now aware, our students will be walking through um, our temperature, our thermal scanners, if you will. We expect our classes to begin at the Goshen High School at approximately 7.30. So period one will begin at approximately 7.30 and each period will be approximately 42 minutes. Um, as the bell schedule goes, we expect approximately five minutes in between each class. Again, please be reminded that in our hallways and throughout the building, there is proper signage reminding students to have uh, and maintain proper distancing, to wear masks, um, and everything in between that will allow us to remain safe within the building throughout our normal day. 
We will be having lunches in the classroom, and this will occur as it stands today during period six. So again, students will have lunches in their classroom during period six, and those lunches will be provided and delivered by members of our food services department, along with many other staff members. As students end period six, uh, they will go about their normal business, um, proceeding through period seven through nine, Students will be responsible for discarding for their lunches prior to leaving the classroom and moving to the next period. Uh, and once again, remember there, there are five minutes in between each class period. Students will go through period seven through nine on the regular bell schedule, which you can currently find uh, on our webpage in the reopening plan. Um, we will be utilizing period 10 for office hours, any help that may be needed um, meetings uh, with students and everything in between uh, to, to assist our students. As students are home on their hybrid days, they are expected to follow the bell schedule to log in um, at the very beginning. And of course, we would expect everyone to utilize class link, which will help us to track attendance along with uh, participation and the handing in of assignments as necessary. You could expect much the same at our CJ Hooker Middle School. Uh, we will have bus arrivals beginning at approximately 7.30 in the morning, and this too will be staggered for all of the reasons mentioned uh, while discussing the schedule at Goshen High School. Students will be um, asked to walk, uh, actually students will have to walk through the thermal scanners at the main entrance upon arrival. Um, classes are expected to begin again at approximately 7.30 and class periods are also approximately 43 minutes. In the, in the C.J. Hooker Middle School, we will offer multiple lunch periods, once again in the classroom, once again delivered by members of our food services department and other staff members. We do have to have multiple lunch periods here based on student schedule, um, and as you do each year, each student will receive this information in their welcome packet sent home prior to the beginning of classes. We expect that the end of the day uh, will be approximately 2.30. Uh, this is both, uh, well, 2.20 at Goshen High School, 2.30 at CJ Hooker Middle School. And again, students that are learning remotely on their remote days will also follow the bell schedules according to their individualized schedule. Wednesdays um, are for the, the half day PD in the afternoon and at the secondary level as it stands today we will focus primarily on asynchronous learning and students will be running through their regular schedule uh, of course completing assignments previously established independently. As we move into Scottsdale Avenue School and GIS we expect the bus arrival at Goshen Intermediate School to begin at approximately 8.45. Those buses, once they become empty uh, of GIS students, once the GIS students have, have exited the bus, they will move immediately to Scottstown Avenue School. Um, and we expect that that should take, you know, approximately five minutes for travel. Again, these buses will be staggered to allow um, for safe distancing being maintained while entering the buildings, and all students will be required to walk through the main entrance uh, through the thermal scanners. We expect class to begin uh, at approximately nine o'clock with a five to 10 minute gap between GIS and Scotchtown Avenue School. So Scotchtown Avenue students more than likely would begin approximately five to 10 minutes after Goshen Intermediate School. So you are now looking uh, at approximately 9.05. Student drop-offs will run simultaneously at Goshen Intermediate School and Scottstown Avenue School. We will be utilizing our school resource officers and the Village of Goshen as necessary, the Village of Goshen Police as necessary to help us maintain safe traffic patterns, to monitor the flow of traffic um, while maintaining safety, of course, in the parking lots of each of our buildings. Um, and I apologize for missing the, the drop-off section here for our secondary schools. However, we will be doing um, any parent drop-offs and student arrivals simultaneously as well at the secondary level while buses are coming in. 
lunches will be based on the established schedules by grade level in each K through five grade level. Um, our building level administrators working closely with each grade level and with each teacher um, will be establishing those lunchtime routines. And again, you will receive all this information in your welcome packet with the time uh, that works for your child's class. They, they will be based on hallway locations and the, the let's call it the workflow uh, established by Mr. Mulnickel in food services. There will be scheduled recess periods. There may be shortened recess periods. There may be multiple recess periods, um, all of which would be utilized to get our students some fresh air, to allow our students to be active. Um, and also at times, outdoor areas may be used uh, for instructional purposes, for mask break purposes, uh, and everything in between based on our teacher discretion um, in discussions with our classroom principals, or rather our building principals. We expect the end of the day procedures to begin at Goshen Intermediate School at approximately 3 o'clock, uh, and at Scottstown Avenue Schools at approximately 3.15. Again, the buses will come into the parking lots at GIS while our pickups are going on simultaneously. Once again, utilizing um, our Village of Goshen Police and our school resource officers to manage traffic flow. Um, the way that we, we feel about the hybrid models, it leads into our remote models. So again, in the remote models, we will follow the same bell schedules at the secondary level and our teachers at the elementary level will be working to establish their regular content area times and special area times based on each classroom. Uh, it is very important to know that you will receive this information as far as um, class times from your classroom teachers and your building level principals throughout the school year with any necessary changes and more importantly with your welcome letters that will be sent home via mail. We want our classroom teachers to have as much latitude as possible to manage our classroom in the remote setting. So in the remote setting, we do not expect our teachers and our students to be on screen live um, for seven and a half hours per day with no breaks in between. So in the remote sessions, you can certainly expect there to be um, live streaming for the purposes of direct instruction, if you will, demonstrations for project-based learning, things of that nature, most certainly. And there will also be times where students are able to disconnect from the camera portion of the laptop or rather the Chromebook to, con to, uh, complete, to complete assignments independently. Students at all points in time went home just as they do in the classroom setting, will have access to their classroom teacher because our classroom teachers will be connected with Bluetooth headsets. Although this may seem very difficult to manage, um, personally, we feel that it's no different than every student being in the classroom at one point in time. There may just be one extra management piece thrown in. We also understand uh, that our teachers will have to make some adaptations to become very familiar, but we will have enough time to iron these things out and we're very hopeful that it will run smoothly for us. So again, students will have the opportunity to contact their teacher during live streaming by simply utilizing the microphones on their Chromebooks and our teachers will be able to hear them because they are connected through Bluetooth headsets provided by the district or teachers may utilize a, a Bluetooth headset of their choosing. So it was very important for us to, to try to manage this so that students would receive uh, the, the feedback that they so desire. Um, if it's immediate feedback needed, of course, our teachers will manage that and do the best that they can to uh, provide the feedback necessary for our students. Again, our students are asked to, to log on, especially at the secondary level. Um, at the very beginning of every class period, as dictated by the bell schedule, unique to their individual schedules, we also ask that all of our students log into ClassLink to have immediate access to all necessary platforms and tools. This will also assist us in tracking attendance along with uh, participation and the handing in of assignments. Once again, we want you to know that outdoor areas are able to be utilized as appropriate. 
Our teachers will collaborate with our building level administrators uh, to choose these areas as necessary. Um, we do want our children to have mass breaks. We do want all of these things to be managed safely and we'll work uh, closely and collaborate closely to make all of this possible. At this point in time, I believe we've, we've covered what the hybrid model would look like leading into what the remote model looks like, certainly to begin the school year. We also know that flexibility, adaptability, uh, and, and compassion is key throughout all of this. We encourage our parents to reach out as necessary to our building level administrators, to the classroom teachers. Any assistance that is needed, as you've heard this evening, um, for the technology side of things, um, we have multiple means of communication to get you the assistance that you need. Uh, we would ask that you do that as quickly as possible. Also, um, on the, the line of communication, we want that to be open constantly. You can get in touch with myself, or Mr. Connor, at any point in time through email, um, phone calls if necessary, because we too want to be part of helping you to get exactly what you need. Um, please get in touch with any questions, and we will share with you all this information in our opening packets and work diligently to get this up on the web for you to access as we move closer to the beginning of the school year. Again, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time this evening and your patience throughout this process. Have a good evening. In closing, folks, I want to thank you all for listening in this evening. Um, more information to come. This has been no easy task. As you can see, uh, but I do want to thank all our administrators, our teachers for their hard work. I want to thank the community for their patience and their understanding. And more importantly, uh, we really look forward to seeing each and every one of our students, or your children, on that opening day. So be safe, be well, and have a good evening. Thank you.